Great. As this audience will be well aware, then cyber is all pervasive in our modern world, with businesses, small and large, becoming increasingly dependent on the smooth running of systems and networks that are beyond their control. The internet is truly global. In less than 15 years, the number of web users has exploded from 16 million in 1995 to more than 1.7 billion today, more than half of whom are in developing countries. By 2015, it's said that there will be more interconnected devices on the planet than humans. Therefore, the economic and social well-being of our nation, and most other developed nations for that matter, are increasingly reliant on the security and resilience of our interconnected and unclearly defined networks and systems operating in cyberspace. The cyber threat is growing and will continue to do so for as long as cyberspace remains an attractive space, place for criminals and other malicious actors to operate in. But I want to start with a warning. Don't look on cyber as a threat. It's an opportunity as well. I hear some talk about cybersecurity as being about building protective walls to allow business to continue as before. This is the wrong approach. Wrong because it won't work, and wrong because the opportunities of cyber will make organisations work differently if they are to exploit its potential. And behaving differently and learning, learning to thrive in a contested cyberspace will be the key to succeeding in the digital age. Now, I've been looking at cyber for about nine months now, so I'm in no position to lecture you about cyber certainties. But my sense is that this topic has taken the mass market by surprise. Whereas those who've been following this topic for years, and my deputy has been doing this or thereabouts this for something like 20 years, they are not surprised by anything that is now happening. The danger is that surprise makes us leap to dramatic early conclusions that in the cold light of day look ill-judged. Which is not to say that we do not need to act. We do. UK MOD has woken up to the importance of cyberspace and the fact that cyber attacks are happening on a daily basis. And the implementation of the Strategic Defence and Security Review has led to the creation of my post precisely because of the urgency of the situation. Indeed, as part of the SDSR response following the identification of cyber threats to the UK as a tier one threat on a par with international terrorism, I'm encouraged by the action I see across government and with the private sector to tackle this very real and present danger to our commerce, to our security and to our operations. Is current resource like to prove enough? Well, no general ever admits that he has enough resource, and I won't claim that 90 million pounds over four years for the Defence Cyber Security Programme is adequate, not least because I can't be sure what the evolving challenge will demand. But in a calamitous financial position, for the government to allocate £650 million pounds new money to the national programme, including £90 million to defence, is a very good start and shows intent. Now, within the MOD, we're developing the Defence Cyber Operations Group with a view to placing it under the newly created Joint Forces Command from the 1st of April 2012. Across government and the private sector, work is being undertaken to form key relationships to share threat information and best practice to ensure that the UK remains a safe place to do business and to foster the innovation and openness that cyber brings. But we need to try to think clearly and recognise cyber what it is, spot the continuities as well as the departures, and judge between what is evolution and genuine revolution. It's clear that we need to work towards some form of international agreement on cyber security in a world where digitisation has become ubiquitous, but where should we begin? Who should we make these agreements with and for what aspects of cyber security? Our traditional defence and trading partners, that's the US, the Five Eyes, the European Union, and NATO, may seem like a good place to start, but cyber crosses all international boundaries and is often used by individuals and non-state actors. Therefore, how much protection would this limited circle give us? This interconnected nature of cyber puts everyone at risk, but also makes everyone responsible. So how do we ensure that industry and individuals play their part in this global agreement? The low entry cost and difficulty in attributing cyber attacks would make a global treaty extremely hard to enforce. Additionally, the rapid rate of change in the cyber domain compared to the length of time it would take for multilateral negotiations to agree on this dynamic topic, risks any treaty being out of date on ratification and makes any assessment of the full implications of the treaty difficult for nations to understand. Hence, agreeing some norms of behaviour and best practice and developing practical confidence building measures among states is the best way to proceed initially. Indeed, this approach and type of discussion 
is at the very heart of the FCA's sponsored London Conference on Cybersecurity on the 1st and 2nd of November of this year. I personally am very excited about this event and will watch keenly to see what developments arise from it. Now it's worth noting at this point that the UK military does not have the lead for national cyber defence. Outside the MOD, I worked at a cabinet office and within the cabinet office specifically for the Office of National Security and Information Assurance. But there remains no stipulated national or international lexicon of cyber terminology, hence no agreement about what cyber actually means. Now I find it most useful to define cyberspace as an information space created by networked IT infrastructure in order to be manipulated and exploited by humans. As such, this fits with cyber as a domain, a man-made construct or a district under rule to follow the OED definition, which itself sits within the environment of the electromagnetic spectrum. And this environment is itself just another medium through which to deliver effect, to be thought of in similar ways to air, land and sea environments, with a major difference that cyberspace is unbounded by geography. It has to be thought of as global. Now, I don't expect you all to agree with that. Indeed, this is the topic is still being hotly debated, but I'd be delighted to hear of any improved definitions that any of you might have. Nonetheless, I find it useful to view cyberspace as ultimately a medium through which to achieve an end. It is not an end in itself. By analogy, therefore, cyber war, cyber crime, cyber terrorism, cyber espionage are new only insofar as cyberspace is the new medium through which to conduct war, crime, terrorism, espionage. And what makes cyber so potent to the all-pervasive nature of computers in our lives, which creates huge vulnerabilities, and the low technology entry level, which put the anonymous hackers on a par with 9-11 bombers and creates a huge effect by exploiting our investment in technology. And before we get consumed by gloom of this apparent catastrophe curve or discontinuity in the evolution of threats, I'd offer two considerations that might encourage us to see some light in the darkness. First, all technological actions have their reactions. The great Major General Bony Fuller called this the constant tactical factor, whereby every advance on the battlefield was closely followed by, indeed prompted, its response or countermeasure. Now, quite what the technological reaction to cyber will be is as yet unclear, but a response will emerge, or a different threat will overtake it. Either way, let's not get paralysed by cyber. Even as we struggle with this latest big idea, the smart money will be off finding the technological or behavioural response to cyber, or the next big idea after cyber. And recognising this helps us avoid the more hubristic judgments about the changes required. For much of our fear of cyberspace is created by our failure to understand it, and the psychological impulse, therefore, to call it a revolution. And this revolution led to blinds us to the evolution in nature of much of cyber. Sorting out what is truly novel from what is more a question of mass offers one useful entry point for tackling this challenge. But quantity issues can be dealt with by more of the same. It is the quality of the different challenges that will need truly new responses. Which is not to downplay the importance of mass. If you look at the mass of personnel that China and the PLA are putting to operate in cyberspace, the adage about quantity having a quality all its own springs to mind. Now the second sort of more positive aspect might be to say that what we present as vulnerabilities to ourselves are also vulnerabilities for people we might view as our competitors. Stuxnet terrified the world, the perpetrators, whoever they might have been, as well as the bystanders and the victims. So the most popular approach to agreeing how to manage our activities in cyberspace will be to start with what unites us, our common interests, rather than what divides us. And indeed, this is the uh, psychological start point of the FCO conference. Now, on this basis, the people we should really fear are such as the Lord's Resistance Army in Central Africa, with no technological dependence on cyber at all, but who might prove immune to any such deal, yet develop the capability to use it at will. Which I suppose points to a final observation I would make about cyber, which is that it is all about people, not about technology at the end of the day. It's a tool by which people interact, for better or worse. Keep the people factor in sight, and you'll keep cyber grounded in its human purpose. And I'd like to offer a number of points for you to ponder. 
I have argued that the focus should be on the ends of human activity through cyberspace rather than on cyberspace itself. In which case, we should recognize that laws apply to ends, not means or mediums. A bank robbery is still a crime, whether it is done at gunpoint or by a cyberspace. Before reaching for new legislation, the real question is how to extend existing legislation, much of international, to cover crimes committed by a cyberspace. Next, addressing the issues presented by increasing dependency and interconnectedness are not issues for any government department or any nation in isolation. We need a whole of society response. Governments will have to provide leadership and resource, but so will industries. They own so much of the infrastructure that we all rely on. We must all challenge the feeling of hopelessness that comes from fear from a threat that is not understood. And we should take comfort from the percentage of problems that cyberspace, from cyberspace that could be solved by good cyber hygiene. Now, GCHQ puts the figure at 80%. Last week, Brett Arsenault, the Chief Information Security Officer of Microsoft, put it at 96%. What is your company doing to get your people to improve their cyber hygiene? For well, here is a quick win in terms of cyber security, but also in terms of giving hope in the face of uncertainty. And in the UK, note, only some 25% of all purchases of a new PC ever activate their online virus protection. I'd like to think that businesses and industry are better repaired, but anecdotal evidence suggests otherwise. And there is no point trying to avoid the issue. This is about securing our lives and livelihoods in the 21st century. Indeed, it's about living in the digital age. There is no opt-out clause. You do not need to have a personal computer, your personal data, to be at risk these days. And a failure to address these issues risks our prosperity, our societal well-being, and potentially our national and international security. So, cyber should very firmly now be on the national and international agenda. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>